Uh, hello and welcome to Highland Country Festival. We're glad that you've joined us here. Uh, if we've not yet met, my name is Bill Rector. I'm delighted to be the teaching pastor. Uh, every week, this is what we try to do. This absolutely beautiful worship where our hearts grow closer to the Lord, and then we open God's Word, and we ask Him to teach us His ideas. And we are in the middle of a verse-by-verse study of uh, the Gospel of Luke, and we're in chapter 9. And so we're going to continue that this morning. Uh, we had seen last week something really interesting. It's called the transfiguration. Nothing big. We just saw Jesus revealed with the glory of God living inside of him. And it was an unbelievable, really, event where Jesus took Peter and John and James up on a mountainside and he was transformed. It was like a metamorphosis. He was transformed in front of them. Moses and Elijah appeared in the audible voice of God, said, this is my son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. That's a big deal, isn't it? And today we're going to come down from that mountaintop experience of the revelation of the glory of the Lord, which was revealed. And I'm afraid once you're on a mountaintop, sometimes the only place you have to go is down. And we're going to see a little bit of a contrast today. Luke, in the next few verses in the story that he tells us today, is going to literally bring us down and figuratively, I'm afraid, bring us down a little bit back to the fallen earth. So uh, if you will join me, I'm in uh, the Gospel of Luke, and it's in chapter 9, and uh, we'll pick up in verse 37 here. The next day, when they came down from the mountain, a large crowd met him. A man in the crowd called out, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only child. A spirit seizes him, and suddenly he screams. It throws him into convulsions so that he foams at the mouth. It scarcely ever leaves him and is destroying him. I begged your disciples to drive it out, but they could not. Oh, unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied. How long shall I be with you and put up with you? Bring your son here. Even while the boy was coming, the demon threw him to the ground in a convulsion. But Jesus rebuked the evil spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. And they were all amazed at the greatness of God. While everyone was marveling at all that Jesus did, he said to his disciples, listen carefully to what I'm about to tell you. The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. But they did not understand what this meant. It was hidden from them, so they did not grasp it, and they were afraid to ask him about it. And this, beloved, is the word of the Lord, and the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. So let's dig in a little bit. We, we start on, on a mountaintop. This is one of those accounts that's helpful because it, it is also told in Matthew's gospel and in Mark's gospel. And there's some sidelights that we could pick up from there. But one of the things that's interesting about it is that all three of the accounts of this incident put it right after the transfiguration. So we have reason to locate it there. And, and I, if you've been studying your Bibles, one of the things that you notice is not everything is chronological. I think that's one of the hardest things for people that are new to the Bible to understand is that, is that it doesn't always occur the way we as Americans or Westerners would, would tell a story. Sometimes you have the story told and then there's a, a story here that would drop back into that. And the Old Testament and the New Testament are like that. So sometimes an event that's told in Luke and Matthew and Mark we, we're not sure exactly where it happened. This one, we, we really are. All three of them put this right after the transfiguration, and that's helpful for us. And Luke says that explicitly. In verse 37, he says, The next day, when they came down from the mountain, a large crowd met him. And this, you know, there's a contrast here. If you are a literature teacher, or uh, you, you, you'll recognize this is setting up something. We're supposed to be contrasting what happened the next day. And there's a large crowd. Large crowds followed Jesus everywhere at this time in his ministry. And we are late in Jesus' ministry. Jesus' ministry was a, about three years. I think we're in the last six months of that ministry, which is really interesting because we're not even halfway through the book of Luke. Some of you keep reminding me that after a year of studying it, but 
it's just too good to go any faster. Um, no, so we're, we're nearing, uh, you know, what would be the last quarter, and maybe even farther in Jesus' ministry. And, and, and so we're kind of getting to this end. And at this time, uh, crowds meeting with him. So uh, Luke is doing this. Then uh, verse 38 says, A man in the crowd called out, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only child. The Spirit seizes him, and he suddenly screams. It throws him into convulsions so that he foams at the mouth. It scarcely ever leaves him and is destroying him. Um, please notice that this is the man's only child. Uh, I think that's a, a detail that only Luke points out, but it's really important. I don't really want to digress too far into this phenomenon of demon possession. It's, it's one of those things that's very interesting to us as Christians. I, I just want to tell you that there's really two guardrails that we have to have on a conversation about that. You know, when we confess the Nicene Creed, the creed that all Christians believe, we say, I believe in one God, the Father, maker of heaven and earth, of all things seen and unseen. Many of you learned this in Sunday school. There is an unseen realm, brothers and sisters. There is an unseen realm, and there are beings that live in that unseen realm that are your enemies, that set out to take you away from following the Lord, and they set out to destroy you like they're doing with this young man. That is a real thing. But if we as Christians give them too much credit, then we actually shift some of the glory of worship that is due God, and we give it to them. I, I know people that are more demon fearers would be the best way to describe their religion than people who are worshipers of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, when you believe what the Bible says about him, that he is the son of God, that he paid for your sin and made a way for you to have a relationship with God, the Holy Spirit, which is also God, lives inside of you, and I promise there's not room for anybody else in there when it comes to unseen spirits. Greater is he that lives in you than he that lives in the world. I tell you that so that we do not make the mistake of thinking that this is just baloney, but neither do we fear or make the mistake of believing that God is not superior to these demons and all of their forces, amen? So this is important for us uh, that we do this. But I will say that this particular spirit is violent. Some of the things that he does here are different than what we've seen in the Gospels before. And that is difficult. This man then says in verse 40, I begged your disciples to drive it out, but they could not. And uh, notice that the disciples, the use of the word could is deliberate. It doesn't say they would not. No, we're not, we're not even going to try. No, they, they, we can infer from this language that the disciples tried and failed. Now, I want you to think about this. Remember, Jesus' primary ministry was teaching. If you're a teacher, and I am one, I primarily teach algebra to 16-year-olds, which makes me really good at enhanced interrogation techniques. <laughs> They're in the news lately, and I'll just tell you, there's nothing like a quiz over the quadratic formula. Mr. Rector, your students don't seem to know the quadratic formula. Who is that a reflection on? Me. I begged your disciples. See, I didn't, I begged that guy over there to do it and he couldn't. No, your disciples. Do you understand that this, this is actually a reflection on Jesus to some degree? Fair or unfair, this is really true. As Christians, the reality, and it is, it's not always fair. But our actions, and sometimes our inactions, our faith, our lack of faith, our unity, and our lack of unity reflect upon our Lord sometimes. There's a quote from Frederick Nietzsche, perhaps the most messed up philosopher in human history. But he said this, I might believe in the Redeemer if his followers looked more redeemed. That's convicting for me, especially as I drive. That's why there's, there's no Jesus fish on the back of my car, thank God. It's really... Seriously, I, 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 this is not always fair, but it is true. 
The mission of the Lord is greater than our individual missions, and how we carry that on sometimes is a reflection on him. And, and that's, like I say, you know, the reason that's not always fair is because the church is also a hospital for sick people, right? I'm, I'm right there among them, right? Chief of sinners. We were all patients in this same hospital where we check in. And so, of course, as sinners, there's hypocrisy between what we profess we want to do and what we're actually going to do. We know that. So it's really not fair to be judged upon that. And yet the truth of the matter is to an unbelieving world, they look at us and, and we may be, you've heard, the only Jesus some people see that week. Oh, gosh, I really hope there's a better Jesus than me driving around in Dallas. Psalm 106 takes this concept a little farther, and I'd like to introduce you to it. It says in, in uh, verses 6, 7, and 8, it says, We have sinned, and these are the people of Israel talking. We have sinned even as our fathers did. We have done wrong and acted wickedly. When our fathers were in Egypt, they gave no thought to your miracles. They did not remember your many kindnesses, and they rebelled by the sea, the Red Sea. Yet he saved them for his name's sake to make his mighty power known. Does, does that ever cross your mind? That there are times when you will be a representative of God and God will work through you, not because you did it so well, but because for his name's sake, it's more important. I wanna let you in on something. And I, I'm, every time before I take to this podium and address you, that's one of my fervent prayers Lord, I'm such a turkey, and I'm, I have years of sinful behavior. My resume would not entitle me to this podium at all. But for your sake, will you teach your people through this gift you've given me? That's my fervent prayer to him. You have a similar situation at some point in your neighborhood, in your walk, in your life. For God's sake, he will use you, not for yours. See, the, this is the hardest thing to accept. This universe is not about me. I want to tell you, I was in my 30s before I came to that conclusion, right? It's about God, and for his sake, he will do things. And he's, Jesus is going to do that here. His disciples have failed, but he's going to do that here, but not first without a little commentary. And he says this in verse 41. Oh, unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you and put up with you? Bring your son here. Now, this sounds harsh, I mean, how often do we greet people with, hello, unbelieving and perverse generation. Welcome to Highland Country Fellowship. <laughs> Some of you are laughing. But why don't we start that next week and just see how many visitors we can chase away with that. If we've got a parking problem, maybe that's one of the things. Oh, it, it, it's, it's really hard. There are some words of Jesus, there's no softening. You know, a couple weeks ago when he said, you have to be able to pick up your cross daily, that, there's just no, a cross doesn't mean anything but a form of execution and a humiliating form of execution. So there's just, there's no way to soften that. But this one is a little bit easier because I think Jesus is actually quoting something Moses said in Deuteronomy 32. And so I kind of want to take you back to this, uh, this time, and I, I love, man, I'll tell you what, I know you guys do not often study Deuteronomy, but if you want to take your Bible study to an interesting level, get there, because it is absolutely amazing, some of the things that go on there. This is a time in the latter part of Deuteronomy where Moses is dying, and Moses will not get to go over into the promised land with the rest of the Hebrews. So God has told him that. He says, you're going to stay here. I want, I want you to bring Joshua and, and I, I want to you know, commission him, and then I've got a special task for you, Moses. I, I want you to write a song for your people, okay? Beginning in, in, in Deuteronomy 31, verses 21 and 22. And when many disasters and difficulties come upon them, this song will testify against them. Isn't that a great song? Wouldn't you, could I teach you a song that you will remember in your mind forever, and it will always testify against you? How's that for a happy song? Because it will not be forgotten by their descendants. I know what they're disposed to do. Even before I bring them into the land, I promised on oath. Do you catch that? God is not fooled by our behavior. He knows before. It's not like he's going, well, I sure hope they'll keep these commands. He knows they're going to break them. So Moses wrote down this song that day and taught it to the Israelites. 
Isn't that amazing? You know, God, God is never surprised. But before teaching the song to Moses, Moses had a little meeting with the Levites, and he said this in verse 27, For I know how rebel, rebellious and stiff-necked you are. If you've been rebellious against the Lord while I'm still alive with you, how much more will you rebel after I die? Wow, how much longer will I be with you? Are you hearing a little of the similarity? And then, well, then we get to the song in, in Deuteronomy 32. This is such a happy... Sammy and I are going to try and set this to music. If we use a banjo and an accordion, there's hope for this song, okay? Because those are the happiest instruments on earth. But otherwise, I think this song is... is we're in real trouble here. Deuteronomy 32 is the song of Moses. And it's all, uh, virtually all of Deuteronomy chapter 32. Remember, this is a song that the Hebrew people are supposed to memorize <laughs> so that it will testify against them, right? Isn't that a great idea? It begins easy enough. Listen, O heavens, and I will speak. I, I was trying to put this to a tune later, but, you know, it's... Listen, O heavens, and I will speak. Hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. Let my teaching fall like rain and my words descend like dew. Like showers on new grass, like abundant rain on tender plants. That's actually not bad, is it? That's poetic and beautiful. But then it gets into a, a few verses. Then verse 5, talking about the Hebrew people. They have acted corruptly towards him. To their shame, they are no longer his children, but a warped and crooked generation. You hearing that? It gets even better. A few more verses of this misery, and then it kind of builds to a crescendo in verse 20. I will hide my face from them, he said, and see what their end might be. For they are a perverse generation, children who are unfaithful. So you see, I think Jesus is hearkening back to this. By the way, this would be a funny verse to write on one of your kids' birthday cards, wouldn't it? Deuteronomy 32, 20. Um, I don't know if they're familiar with it, if they need to look it up. You could be halfway back to the nursing home before they figure it out. <laughs> um, I don't know why I'm sick that way. I really am. Jesus is not thinking that way, but I am. So. But what he is saying when he says, oh, unbelieving and perverse generation, he's really thinking back to this time. This is probably how Moses felt. Now, I'm about to die, and, and I know what's ahead for you guys. How much longer will I be with you? Uh, and I want to make sure that we hear that, that this is, this, is, this is an exasperating thing for the Lord, right? He's frustrated because this is his name that's being let down. It's a reflection upon him to some degree. And he's frustrated because, like Moses, he knows he's not going to be with them long. But he's also frustrated because this is a violation of faith. The disciples here are, should have known better, right? And this is where we kind of get into a discussion of biblical faith. And, and I hope you'll indulge me a little bit in that because, you know, we throw around the word faith all the time in our culture. We're people of faith sometimes is the way we're described. And I think it's really important for us to make sure that we kind of center on what the Bible means by the word faith. See, some people feel like faith. I was watching, it was last Christmas, Miracle on 34th Street, right? The original one, right? And, and um, it said, you know, faith, honey, is believing in things even though reason tells you not to. No, that's not what the Bible wants you to do is faith. I don't know what you call that. I really don't. Maybe that's just wishing real hard right, for it to snow in the middle of August, right? That's the kind of thing. That is not a biblical definition of faith. Sometimes people think that faith is uh, something that you develop over time by observations, right? So, for instance, on the way here, we uh, stopped at all the red lights and we went at all the green lights. And we did that with a lot of faith that all the other drivers were going to do the same thing. Because if they didn't, you can imagine how much fun it would be getting here every day. Right? How much more frustrated I'd be. So to some degree, we have faith in stoplights, don't we? Right? But that's really not the kind of biblical faith. That's something over you know, years of observation, you've seen that and you can rely on it. Now, by the way, people who've been walking with Jesus for a long, long time have that kind of faith in him because they can rely on it. But that's, you know, the Bible's definition of faith is different. And it's actually, it's really simple. It's believing what God said because he said it. 
That's it. If you want to keep it really simple, believing what God has said because he is the one who said it, right? Uh, Jesus loves me, this I know. You know why? Because the Bible tells me so. I, I believe in what God said because he said it. Last week we heard this beautiful oratio from uh, Handel's Messiah, right? And the first part of it was, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. It was from Isaiah 40, chapter 5. I don't know if we've got that one or not, but it's Isaiah 40, chapter 5 was, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. There it is, right? And did you hear, and the glory, the glory of the Lord, that's as far as I'll go, okay, shall be revealed, right? You heard it? <laughs> I can't stop myself. I was listening to that all week. I was looking for hip-hop versions of it. They don't exist. <laughs> Suddenly. Uh, and all flesh will see it together, meaning at some point, every human being that's ever lived will see this glory revealed. And you know why? Do you know how we can bank on it? What's the last words? For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. That's biblical faith. When, when God says something and you believe it, that's biblical faith. Amen? Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't other examples of faith that we might pray for someone to be healed or we might pray for, for something, a, a, a resurgence of, of, of people believing in Jesus in our country. These are not bad things. But the point is, there's nothing that you're going to pray for. There's no amount of faith that will bring about something that is not in the will of God. And so sometimes we get faith mixed up with other definitions of things. And I just, I want to try and be clear. It's really simple. The Bible teaches it. It's believing what God said. It goes all the way back to Abraham. Genesis 13, I think we got that verse. God takes Abraham outside and he says, take a look at all the stars and count them if indeed you can, right? Meaning you can't. And your descendants will be, this will be, so shall your offspring be. Abraham believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. And this is one of the most important verses in the whole Bible. Righteousness is right standing with God. It's something we know we don't have and we desperately want. And do you know how to gain right standing with God? Believe him. There's no, no amount of works can do it. Riding around on your bicycle with your white shirt won't do it. It doesn't matter how many houses you stop at. There's no check large enough that you can write, but we'd love for you to try. You can't earn your way in. There's nothing you can do. But when you believe God, he says, that, that gains you right standing with me. Isn't that nuts? That's beautiful. Hebrews 11 confirms it this way. It says, and without faith, it is impossible to please God. You, you think about that for a minute. You, that means everything that you think you can do that pleases him, it's impossible to please him without faith without believing him. And that's, that's where this gets awesome here. And then it goes on to say, because anyone who comes to him must first believe that he exists and he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So if you believe something God has said in his word, if you believe it and take it to heart to act on it, implicit in that is that you know that he exists and that you're believing him. And that's what Hebrews is telling us. Does that make sense? I, I just, this is the biblical faith the Bible talks about. So what we're going to happen here in this incident is we're going to contrast the faith of the disciples, which was a violation of that principle, and the faith of this man who is really weak. He does not have great faith, but he brings his son to Jesus anyway. And we're going to see a contrast between those two. Okay? And this is interesting because this is where Matthew and Mark's version help us out. They give us a little bit more information. Okay? In Matthew's version... After this all had happened, the disciples kind of, they say to Jesus, hey, uh, beginning in, in Matthew 17, verse 19, then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, why, why couldn't we drive it out? And Jesus replied, because you have so little faith. I tell you the truth, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, 
and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. And see, people interpret this, and they take it out of the context of this incident, and they unfortunately believe that you, because of something you possess, not something God possesses, your faith and belief in something might change the will of God. It will not. I'm sorry. It doesn't mean we shouldn't pray like crazy for people who need it. And the prayers of righteous people avail much. We know that. So, I mean, that is part of what we're doing. But Jesus himself once prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, Father, take this cup from me, but not my will, but yours be done. You see, because when he he said, God, if there's any other way, I'd like to do that, please. And do you know what the answer was? No. No. Sometimes our culture honors people who won't take no for an answer. That's an honorable thing unless the answer should actually be no. And even the answer to one of Jesus' prayers was no. Because it was within the will of the Father. And and see, Jesus even knew that as he was asking. Not mine, but your will be done. And this this is what happens when we pray for our loved ones, when we pray for our friends. We need to make sure we understand There is no amount of faith that will change the will of God and God's plan. And so we've got to be careful about this. This was really targeted towards the disciples. Why? Why was he so mad at the disciples? I mean, these are just routine guys. They were just fishermen and people. Well, take a look in in the very first verse of chapter 9. Right? I know it seems like it's a long time ago for us, but the very first verse of chapter 9, when Jesus called the 12 together, he gave them power and authority to drive out just a few demons. D- demons for a couple of months, and then their subscription expires and they have to renew. All demons. If you believe, remember, faith is believing what God said. God stands before them and says, I give you authority to drive out all demons. And they forgot to believe. That's the problem with their faith. Do you see that? Do you see that? They should have known better. Now, I want you to contrast that with the faith of the boy's father. And we don't hear about this in Luke. We hear about it in Mark. Right? Because there's an exchange that Jesus has with this boy's father. And this is an interesting contrast because, you know, the disciples get rebuked for being an unbelieving and perverse generation because they failed to believe what God had told them. Right? But now this man has serious doubts, but it seems to be okay with Jesus. It's in Mark chapter 8, verse 21. Jesus asked the boy's father, How long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. And by the way, please keep in mind, I did tell you, this is an an exceptionally violent spirit here, more than usual. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. Jesus' next words, if you can, do you know who you're talking to? Everything is possible for him who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible, oh, I do believe. But help me with my unbelief. Do you see the contrast? These people should have known not long ago they were given power and authority. This guy is just bringing his son out of desperation. There's a healer. I hear you can help. I do believe or I wouldn't have brought him. But help me with just the fact that I've got a little bit of faith. And you know why we know Jesus rewards that? Because he heals the boy. And this is different. Does that make sense to you? It's a great example of the differences in faith. So Jesus continues in compassion. He says, bring your son here. And then Luke, uh, back to Luke 9, verse 42. He says, even while the boy was coming, the demon threw him to the ground in a convulsion. But Jesus rebuked the evil spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. And they were all amazed at the greatness of God. Now I want you to pick up on something. Luke didn't tell us about the faith of the disciples or he didn't tell us about the faith of the father. Luke's point was seeing this after the mountaintop and and he's, and he's, and he's telling us about this incident. And it ends with a real funny warning to Jesus' disciples about what might happen to him. And I want you to understand why. You know, in Luke's gospel, whenever Jesus would encounter demons, they would fear and run from him. You know, are you here to damage us before the appointed time? You know, that kind of stuff. 
This one is not. Now, some commentators believe this may have been Satan himself. I don't know. But this was an exceptionally violent demon. He tried to kill the boy. He tried to kept trying to hurt him. He tried to throw him into fire and then throw him into water. And he was trying to destroy him. And even in the last minute, I mean, I'm going to try and act this out, but I want you to feel this for a moment. This is an emotional time here. In the last minute, when Jesus is telling him, let that boy go, he says, okay, here. And he throws him down in one last act of violence. Don't you hate him? Don't you hate Satan? And this is what Jesus is doing. He's seeing this, and he realizes this demon was torturing this man's only son. And what lies ahead for me is torture at the hand, the only, the only son of the father, torture at the hands of other demons. This prefigured the cross for him. You see the contrast? He comes down from a mountain where he's glorified and his glory will be revealed. And then he comes to realize his disciples don't have as much faith as they should and a cross lies before him. You see that? And this is why Luke told us this gospel that way. From a mountaintop to a reminder of the cross. And while everyone else was amazed, verse 44, while everyone was marveling at all that Jesus did, he said to his disciples, listen carefully to what I'm about to tell you. The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. That sounds non sequitur, but now you know why. Because he's just been reminded of the fact that <laughs> this will not go the way you think it will go, to quote Luke Skywalker. This is not going to go that way. Right? But they did not understand what this meant. It was hidden from them, so they did not grasp it. And they were afraid to ask him about it. See, it might have been that God prevented them from understanding it because it was all they could bear. That's very possible. But I think really, this is just, they don't want to go there. It's the last place on earth you want to go. The idea of Messiah is one who's going to conquer the Romans and set your people free. The idea of a betrayed into the hands of men, suffering at the hands of Satan, murdered Messiah, it was in nobody's dictionary. Nobody's thought was that that was what would happen to Jesus. And he's reminded of it. And I think he in, is trying to actually prepare them. I want you to listen to me carefully. I know everybody's amazed and this seems like a great thing. There's some bad stuff that has to come ahead. But they didn't get, they don't, I'll tell you what, they couldn't handle the truth is another movie line that fits here. It's a good thing they're movies, otherwise I would have no reference points and no personality whatsoever, right? They don't know, and they don't want to know. They didn't know, and they were, they were afraid to ask him about it because they, they're sensing that the answer was bad. Are you with me on this? Gosh, what an unbelievable incident here. And it does have a happy ending in the end. After suffering at that demon, the only son has returned to his father. And after suffering at the hands of men and suffering for you and me, Jesus has returned to the father. So this has a happy ending, and we, we know this, but it must have been really gut-wrenching for the disciples to walk through that with him. You know, for us, though, 2,000 years later, there's this lesson of faith. What is it? What, has God written things down for us that we should believe? Yes, we're so privileged to have it right in front of us. And we study it, and we believe it because he said it. And, and that is faith that credits us with right standing with him. And we increase in that. We give him glory, and we believe just what he said. Father in heaven, you know, we believe help us with our unbelief. Give us the strength and the courage to accept your word, not necessarily because it makes sense to us, but because you said it. And at times when our faith, Father, is small, let it rest on the mountainous word of your truth. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.